and address what we want. Because a lot of times we might want, we might be in a corporation and want to be in a different kind of level at that corporation, but we just kind of like stay stuck at where we're at and we don't go to the boss and be like, look, I've been here for 10 years, 15, 30. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You've been there and I've gathered these skill sets. Why don't you at least let me try my hand at whatever you want to, that you might feel that you have learned in that corporation sure. and everything. But I think sure. we don't do enough of that. We just kind of like let the let, let the job dictate where it wants us versus trying sure. to have the um, versus trying to tell the job where we think we should be. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, I think it takes balls. I think it takes guts and I think it takes courage and I think it takes stepping outside of your comfort zone. I mean, I was always amazed. I got away with a lot in corporate America. I was very entrepreneurial. I just asked for what I wanted insisted on it, made myself extremely valuable, positioned myself to be very valuable in terms of what, you know, projects that needed to happen. I was in charge of a Y2K project and that, you know, back when the sky was falling, you know, 1999. Uh, and made myself valuable, made myself indispensable, made myself a, a part of the big strategy of the organization and asked for what I wanted and was shameless about it. And so you'd be amazed at what you can negotiate if you have the courage to ask for what you want. Be amazed. But what do you think is the driving force that t- people that stops people from asking for what they want? Because, like I said, I imagine that you probably have had to get people out of that with the hypnosis and other things. So, what what have you learned is one of the more common driving forces to stop people from getting that that they actually want in their career or in their life um, in general. Like, a lot of it, a lot of it comes down to two those like two like uh, essential limiting beliefs that people carry, and a lot of other limiting beliefs are sort of at the at the uh, or like a derivative of this limiting belief, but but I'm not good enough and I'm unlovable. Are the two big drivers that stop people in their tracks from at, from asking for what they want? Not good enough is a big one, and it does it makes all kind it wreaks all kind of havoc in people's lives, right? In terms of a the opportunity cost is not going for what you really want, and the time that you waste, you know, not pursuing what you want, and the, you know, the money that you spend and the energy that you expend, and all the, you know, just all the costs. So people, I think people don't necessarily, they don't, they don't, we're not, you know, usually hip to what it's costing them to stay the same, right? Like they they think that the price of change is expensive, but they don't realize how expensive it is to stay the same. So, right, so, again, apathy, right, and and then it being all sort of couched in, you know, not good enough, not lovable, um, it really is, are big ones. Yeah, because I've seen that with a couple of people in their different careers where they'll believe that they will not achieve the goal that they want because they don't have the talent to achieve that goal, whatever that talent is. But oftentimes mm-hmm. the talent is right there. And I also find that sometimes people will – Stay stuck on um, stuck on neutral, or even stuck some cases. Some cases, the world amounts to almost like reverse because they will stay in jobs that are not comfortable for them or that are not beneficial to them. But because it's a job, we hear that old saying, you know, it's it's paying the bills. So yes, it may be paying sure. the bills, but if it's not, but if it's only paying the bills and it's not giving you more than just the bill paying, then you're probably at a loss because you're probably not getting the actual true life benefits that you could actually get if you were doing that job that you were put on the earth to do. Because I find that a lot of times people do that. They they stay stuck on kind of like driving in, uh, and I'm not a driver, but kind of like just kind of like just being on neutral or not really trying to go too far. It's kind of like the the, the wheels are moving in motion but not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I think you gotta live on the, it's it's a high wire rack. You gotta kind of live on the edge, right? And 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 getting what you want in life is living on the edge. It's 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 risky, and you get you risk failure and rejection and all kinds of things, right? But there's nothing like it in terms of the level of satisfaction, in terms of the level of fulfillment. When you you know become what you're capable of becoming, there's just nothing like that. There's nothing like doing what you know you're capable of doing. You become, you esteem yourself in ways that are really unimaginable, right? Because you are doing, you're proving to yourself who you are. 
I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, there has to be a crossing over of identity for for be a, a way in which people cross over and decide like they can make money, decide that they can print money at will, decide that they can make, you know, six and seven figures a year. It's all a decision. And so once you decide that, then there's sort of no turning back, right? And it can be scary and it can be fraught with difficulty and challenge and obstacles. But the question is, is who are you in the matter, right? Like who do you choose to be in the matter? And when we set ourselves free and and set our big highest aspiration and decide to meet that and and step into that, you know, we just, the the universe sort of opens up to us and, and life becomes a great joy and a great fulfillment. Oh, no doubt about that. Because I know that sometimes we also get caught up by, um, and I just wonder what you think of this. Sometimes I also find that we let people that are not necessarily of the same vision help shape our vision, and sometimes it's not in the most positive way. I'm thinking about, like, sometimes how the, I was, we had this conversation, I believe, last week's show and everything about how the naysayers, we sometimes can be family naysayers, so members of your own family they will try to shoot down your business idea or try to shoot it down without giving thought to what you have done in terms of the research and everything. But also I sometimes find it sometimes institutions, like sometimes members of the church and your, your connecting institutions, whether that's a church, whether that's civic organizations or whatever, can also be people that will sometimes shoot down and not support your business. So I was wondering if you've had to cope with that when you talk to your people that you're coaching and how you cope with that when you when they realize that there are people within their own family or in their own communities that are not necessarily being allies. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question because I would say that part of my biggest struggle I think in um in building what I've built and doing some of the things that I've done have been qualifying people. Right? Not everybody is qualified to give you advice <laughs> about anything. Right, um, and we oftentimes want to go into resonance and harmony with people and feel appreciated and wanted, but they're not necessarily people that that can give us and are qualified to give us advice. So I, you know, I take I take money making advice from people who make money. You know, I take relationship advice from people who are in successful relating. Right, but um, I think one of the biggest things you can do, and I've had to really learn this the hard way because I have been very egalitarian. I was raised in a communist collective. I'm like, let's all go together. Let's do it all together. And it was enough for everybody, right? I was just sort of raised with that consciousness. And so, um, um, but I ended up sometimes dragging people along, right? Instead of them carrying their own load, right? I ended up, I ended up having to drag them along. Um, so you have to travel light and you have to travel with, with advice that's very highly qualified. And you have to have, make sure that you have people that um, mean you well, right? There can be a lot of envy and a lot of hatred and a lot of haterism out here. I never used to think that because I always think, what's there to be jealous of? If you want, if you want what somebody has, and pay the price that they paid. Like find out what they what price they paid, and then go pay it, and then you can have it too. But um, but that's not true. Everybody doesn't see it that way. So um, vetting and discernment and knowing whose advice and counsel to take is sort of and who to have in your space energetically is sort of is is a very important aspect of all of this is being able to to choose well in that regard. Because it seems to me like it's, it's almost like from what I'm hearing you say, it's almost like you did the reverse of what my dad did and everything. And I'll explain that in a second. My dad actually grew up. His dad was a well-known scientist. The biology building at Central is named after him, and his, and his mother, my grandmother was a librarian who actually created one of the first black, well, the first black library in Raleigh, North Carolina, the state capital and everything. But so they would probably be considered what one of our great leaders back in the day would have considered the challenges camp. My dad then went mm-hmm. on to become a civil rights. My dad then went to, to go home, like I said, he was involved in, I can't remember whether he was a founder, but he was definitely involved in the Malcolm X School. It was in, created in Durham first and then moved to Greensboro and then eventually closed down. So, and he was always involved in the civil rights struggle. So it was almost like he went from being, mm-hmm. you know, coming from a family of very much, for lack of a better word, they were probably considered the bourgeois of our community and everything, to being an activist. You grew up in an activist mm-hmm. community and kind of like going the opposite direction. You would probably be considered like one of the black bourgeois of California these days and everything. I know that term can have negative connotations, but I don't mean it in that way and everything. But I'm just wondering, when you – when you have run across some of your father's peers, 
what has been their reaction to the work that you're doing? Because I'm imagining that they're probably, one, shocked that you're doing it, and two, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases they might even think it's being almost opposed to what they were doing. They were fighting those struggles in the 60s and to some degree the 70s. Well, I mean, you know, again, like I said, the revolution must be monetized, and so perhaps my vantage point, right, and viewpoint comes from having experienced it up close and personal. So, you know, I don't, I'm not in a fantasy about what things take, <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's a fantasy to think that you can get this stuff done unfunded. It just doesn't. That's just not how it works. And the longer we have people perpetuating that myth. And pretending like you know, the, you know, uh, the, 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 the faster our race is to the bottom, right? So I am unapologetic about the fact that, you know, I I I've created movements. I've created the black coaching movement. I've created I'm creating the black mastery movement. Um, but those all those movements take money, and time right. and effort and energy, and they are built and designed to also be profitable. So I just think that that's you just got to do that, and, and you can't listen to people that have a, po- a poverty consciousness. You can't let poverty consciousness dictate your wealth consciousness. And I think you're right. I think we do have a lot of people that have that poverty consciousness and they seem to be perfectly comfortable living that kind of like poverty life. But, you know, that at the end of the day, it doesn't really help anybody, including the greater masses, because I know you can definitely fall into that rut where you're just perfectly fine living in what amounts to close to poverty kind of in, um, income, but that's not going to help you get to the next level. Right, right, right. So, yeah, I just think that I just think that we have to be really clear-minded and clear-eyed about, um, about who we listen to, who we take advice from, who we are influenced by, and what their level of consciousness is. We just have to be more aware of that. Because, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I think people are surprised about, even with the current person that we have in the White House, is that we went from an activist president to a president that definitely came out of the wealth model. Now, whether he did that in Mm -hmm. a moral way or not, that's up to interpretation, because there are definitely some people Mm -hmm. that talk about some of the money that he made and some of the ways that he made the money being very belittling to our people and very uh, taking advantage of our people. And well, he's, I mean, he basically, you know, he basically became a, munder, a money laundering operation for Russia. That's the truth. He, he, he tanked a bunch of businesses. Like, how do you bank up the casino? <laughs> and then basically became a money laundering operation for the Russians and then sold America to the Russians for the privilege of laundering their money. That's what really happened. <laughs> That's just the right to the core of it, and I can't argue with that at all, because that's definitely what I was geared at. It was it seems that the message basically sold it to the Russians for a little to nothing, and now he's still having some of the rewards of that. Uh, one of the jokes that I will sometimes tell my friends, and I'm always semi-joking when I say this, and folks are like, you, you've you got to be kidding me. I'm like, no, I'm not going to be surprised if the, the other thing that he was definitely known for was the TV show of President. So in 2020, if not because I don't think we can cope with having him in office until 2024. But in 2020 or 2021, I used to jokingly say that I'm not going to be surprised if we don't see a Prentice White House, because this is the only White House that I think that inspired as many people this early. So I also think it is quite possible to yeah. follow a whole other TV show right now. But, but Mueller's coming. I, I'm, 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 I've, been, I've been studying Russia and the whole thing quite intensively for the past year. I was saying that Russia was happening way before anybody was talking about it publicly, and I actually would weaponize the media a little bit with it and get people, I would, you know, contact, my media contact, like the Huff Post, and, and get people talking about it, because I'm like, I don't know if you guys see what's, what's happening. Like, I got wind of it really early on. Uh, Mueller's coming, and so there's hundreds and hundreds of civil indictments, and so um, it's it's about to turn pretty, it's about to come hard and fast in terms of, you know, our biggest challenge is going to be what, what do we do when there's no line of succession because the entire GOP is found complicit, right, in Russia yeah. collusion. What do well, we, you know, what, that's, can the country survive that? That's what I'm worried about, us surviving, is can the country survive 
what happens when the whole line of succession is found 